Good morning and welcome to Citizen Extra. I am Anki Gute. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning as all eyes are on the passenger launch of the SGR. We're talking about it, its economic and political implications. Joining me this hour on my panel, Mugo Kibati, the founding director of Vision 2030, director general of Vision 2030. Uh, Amos Kimunye is a former transport minister. He's currently vying for Kipipiri uh, MP and we're going to be talking to him around uh, the transport issue and of course the politics that comes with a mega project like this. We are also live for you in Mombasa and across the stops where this uh, rail is expected to be going. President Uhuru Kenyatta expected to meet guests who will be aboard it and will be taking you live soon as it is officially launched. Uh, but good morning to you gentlemen. I want to begin with you um, uh, Mugo because you were at Vision 2030 um, that crafted the kind of uh, manifesto if you like for the nation into the year 2030. SGR was one of the important components. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Well, thank you, Anne. Uh, as you correctly say, the SGR was a critical component of Vision 2030. As you know, Vision 2030 is Kenya's national and very comprehensive transformation program, uh, which is supposed to lead this country out of its third world status into an upper middle income nation. And infrastructure is a major component of that. In fact, infrastructure is an engine of all sorts of development, from manufacturing to agriculture, getting uh, f uh, produce from farms to markets. And therefore, in the infrastructure uh, plan, uh, rail, transportation was a major part of it. Uh, we have the Northern Corridor, which is a Mombasa Malaba uh, corridor that has existed right from the 19th century with the very first railway line. And so it was, uh, it was determined that it was important to modernize uh, that particular corridor with a modern uh, railway line that would be able to get to offtake goods from uh, the port of Mombasa uh, to Nairobi and to the hinterlands into Eastern Africa. And uh, it was, it, I think it's important to understand that rail transportation, first and foremost, is about goods transportation. I know that today we're very excited, uh, and so am I, about uh, the prospect of uh, passengers being able to travel from Mombasa to Nairobi in four and a half hours, at most five hours, because of the stop in Tito one day. Uh, but as we look at the value that uh, this rail brings to the country, I think it is important to remember that first and foremost, good transportation is why we build railway lines and passenger transportation is a good to have. All right. Um, uh, Kimunya, talk to me about um, rail as the, uh, as uh, Mugo has said, as a better option in terms of transporting goods. Why was this more competitive than other uh, modes of transport? No, if, uh, I think, uh, thanks, uh, Anne, and uh, today is, is really uh, one of those watershed days. Um, when you look at uh, rail transport vis-a-vis -vis the uh, road transports you you're talking about scale here yeah, in the mm -hmm. economies of scale um how much cargo can you move at the you know within a predictable time um how much um trucks do you remove from the roads with all the damage to the roads the accidents the the delays and opening up those road avenues for for other users uh but most importantly is receiving your cargo in nairobi uh, within a set period of six hours. So the implications of that is that manufacturers now in Australia don't have to keep stocks of three months of stock because you don't know when your truck will arrive from Mombasa to Nairobi. Uh, now you can actually move almost into uh, just-in-time production because you know once your cargo lands in Nairobi, it's offloaded from the ship onto the train and within a day you have it uh, in your warehouse. And I think those, those are the in, in efficiencies being built within the transport system that add up uh, accumulating to reduce the overall cost of uh, production and cost of doing business. All right. But, but most importantly is the, the safety, the predictability, and security of the cargo, and moving all those charges that we're seeing uh, being levied on, 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 on the roads, including unofficial tolls, you know, the, the corruption on the roads and all that, all those things will, will go with SGR. Right. Uh, Sam Gituku, our reporter, is live for us in Mombasa. Of course, is awaiting the official launch um, of that uh, railway line, um, at least the passenger uh, component of it. Sam, good morning, and uh, tell us what you're seeing and hearing. Well, a very good morning to you, Anne. As you said, yes, we are here at uh, the Mombasa terminal waiting uh, to board the train. Several passengers have already done so, bearing in mind that we have 15 coaches on the same 
uh, train, of course, being pulled by the same locomotive, uh, there has been quite uh, some aspirations from the various uh, passengers who are here trying to gain access into, into the train. We had been uh, some congestion, some scramble for people trying to go in and uh, access their seats, but of course, there has been a limitation to have to access their seats using some, some tickets that are being issued in as much as uh, they are free, that uh, you didn't have to pay for this inaugural, uh, inaugural trip, and then there had to be scheduling of uh, people where they should be sitting. Uh, but that has been resolved, and currently what we're waiting for is the arrival of President Uhuru Kenyatta, who of course will be flagging off the first train and then board it, uh, so that the journey can begin to uh, towards Nairobi. And also what you see is uh, several dignitaries, including government officials, government ministers, other cabinet secretaries, uh, different ambassadors of different countries, uh, who have uh, been uh, sent to Kenya, of course, making a little bit of the team that is uh, inaugurating uh, this particular particular strain. And that's just to show you the importance that it has in terms of the regional relations and international relations, uh, because the several personalities, apart from the Chinese government, you've seen uh, several ambassadors, as I say, from uh, different countries in Africa and even outside Africa. But also, something important to note is that uh, it has been expected that. Uh, we would be leaving Mumbai, the Mombasa seminars at uh, at 7:30. Then it was pushed to nine, and now it's 9:25. So we're expecting the arrival of President Uhuru Kenyatta, uh, hoping that um, there should be some uh, officialdom in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, this has happened. And so, particularly at the front, at the front of the Mombasa seminars, there is supposed to be an event. President Uhuru Kenyatta will be planting a commemorative tree just to mark this particular moment and then after that you'll be expected to come through the stairs of course uh, the Mombasa Terminus has uh, three layers rather three floors uh, from the ground floor to the second floor he'll be coming up to the platform where he'll be boarding his train or rather his, uh, his coach and uh, take a seat and then the journey can begin towards Nairobi what also we expect and is that uh, the president will be making some stopovers at the different stations remember there are seven intervening a station where passengers can board and get them back, but the main ones are the two, Mombasa and Nairobi. So throughout that, that journey, in as much as it, it has been touted that it should be taking one and a half hours to Nairobi, that may be different, bearing in mind that uh, we'll be doing those stopovers. So that may be different. I don't, we don't know how, by how many hours or how many minutes, uh, because we don't know how much time the president really wants to spend at each and every uh, station along the way. And Right. Um, Sam, there has also been some questions surrounding whether the fact uh, that this train will be completely operational, you know, beginning today. Tomorrow, can commuters board the SGR Nairobi to Mombasa? Well, there has been some communication on the website of the Kenya Railway uh, co company indicating that there should be a train leaving Mombasa tomorrow and also charging customers uh, between 900 and 3,000, that is 900 shillings for the economy class and uh, 3,000 for the business class. Uh, but we don't have the confirmation whether that is still on schedule. Essentially, what should be happening between now and December is that uh, the contractor who has been awarded the contract of managing uh, the SGR for 10 years, that is uh, the China Roads and Bridges Co Corporation, in collaboration with John Holland, the company uh, that is owned by Australian citizens, uh, the, the idea is that uh, between now and December they should be doing what is called scheduling, uh, preparing the, 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 the prices, the, the price tags for the different services, how much it should be, and also ensuring that uh, the ticketing process has been put in place. So uh, in as much as that process will have to wait until December so that people can have the scheduled trip so that you know at a particular hour there's a train that leaves Nairobi for Mombasa, at a particular hour there's a train that uh, passes through Boy or Mudito Ande or even uh, Mistenye, uh, so that is something that you have to wait until this happens in December. But for now, what you understand is that uh, there will be trip, only that uh, it's not be on uh, an official schedule, but that will be being communicated as soon as the, the inaugural trip is done. As we'll be expecting to hear from the Kenya Railway company to tell us what really should be happening and what Kenya should uh, expect in terms of when they can use the fast ride to wherever, either between Nairobi and Mom or coming to Nairobi or really uh, coming to Mombasa and yeah, and Sam, we can already see the president uh, has arrived and he's planting that commemorative tree that you told us about. Could you tell us a little bit about um, the stopovers that we're expecting today? Uh, th the stopovers? Yes, the president is expected to be addressing various um, uh, train side, if you like, uh, or rail side <laughs> stopovers today. Do we, do we know where exactly and, and do we have an estimate on time, an approximation? Well, I I cannot tell you which stations it's certainty because the indication is that uh, uh, 
through the seven intervening stations, he will be stopping. But one that we might be sure about is at the Adi River station, which is uh, the last station before the terminals, the Nairobi terminals, or rather the Nairobi terminal. Uh, so that I can assure you that there will be a stopover. He'll be visiting the Adi River station to go and see how uh, the systems have been put in place. But in as much as the other uh, six stations are concerned, I cannot say it for certainty, but uh, I can assure you that before we get to void, there will be a stopover as the president gets into his some of the work that have been done then uh, to see whether he is satisfied with the certificate of completion that he issued yesterday and expecting to hear from him and maybe even address one as uh, he makes this inaugural tour, or rather inaugural trip to Nairobi and all right, thank you, Sam. We're going to let you go for now and catch up with you later once it is officially flagged off. Our reporter, Sam Gituku, reporting for us live right. um, from Mombasa. And still with me here in studio is uh, founding director general of Vision 2030, Mugo Kibati, and Amos Kimunya, a former transport minister. He's currently vying uh, for Kipipiri legislator. Uh, Mugo, let me return to you. Um, in as far as um, this particular project has been the subject of a lot of politicking um, since the administration took over, particularly on the cost issue. Could you give Kenyans um, perhaps the global view of its import vis-a-vis uh, -vis the politics of the day? Well, uh, thanks, Anne. Uh, I, will, I will leave the politics to the politician uh, on this table. I have never doubled in it, uh, but one can hardly avoid it because this is indeed a very important uh, project, uh, national transformation project, and and and, in, uh, and and one cannot gainsay, because I think we tend to overstate a lot of things. You know, we call projects mega projects, uh, but this is one of those projects that really is uh, a transformative uh, project. And I think, as the former mm -hmm. minister uh, indicated, the impact directly on the economy, manufacturers. Uh, in Nairobi and eventually and remember that this is just a phase one of a much larger project phase two um, right. well phase two at the time that we were both in government was the uh, Nairobi Malaba uh, mm -hmm. you know and that that uh, by the time I left uh, Vision 2030 the designs uh, the physical were, were yet to be undertaken uh, since then I understand there have been a few changes we now have phase two ending in Naivasha and perhaps Naivasha Malaba being phase three uh, but this is, a, this is the first part of a larger project that connects not just Kenya but the region uh, and the impact on manufacturing, uh, on agriculture. In manufacturing, I think the, the former minister indicated uh, that people in Nairobi, in the industrial area now, would be much better able to plan. The supply chain management uh, becomes much easier when you have predictability, uh, when you have lower costs. Uh, those efficiencies will translate uh, into the uh, man manufacturing sector, into the agricultural sector, and eventually to the consumer. So while we are all uh, debating uh, the cost, and I think it's an important debate, uh, you know, because we must always implement projects as efficiently as we can because resources uh, in this country and many other countries are scarce and we must judiciously apply them. But having said that, I think we must not lose sight uh, of eventually what uh, the impact on the economy will be. And I can say that when we envisage this in Vision 2030, as I said, on infrastructure eventually uh, accrues to the consumer, uh, mm -hmm. to the cost of living. Right. Uh, the cost of living in this country has been uh, said to be very high in terms of transportation and energy. And the projects, as you see in Vision 2030, are meant to, hunt to, to, to lower the cost of living. Right. Yeah. Uh, th let me come to you, uh, Amos, again, uh, on the question of politics, you being a bona fide politician. Um, <laughs> to what extent do you believe uh, it has affected perception on this project? And again, to what extent does regional cooperation, you know, having um, East African countries uh, really vested in this project as well, uh, contribute to its success? Uh, and as you recall, this, uh, the SDR project, uh, the initial de debate on that started way back in mm. 2003. Mm. The actual launch of the, of the project started again 2008 with uh, President Kibaki and mm. President Seveni mm. at State House saying there's a desire to change from meter gauge to the standard gauge and, and then work began. But it was the GBD government that really now took the execution phase and put it within the, the, the TNA or the, the, the Jubilee Coalition uh, Manifesto um, in 2013. And um, because of it being uh, uh, an election uh, pledge by the President Uhuru and his deputy, 
uh, William Ruto that they were going to deliver the SGR within their first term. It now took a political dimension as the opposition then started, you know, poking holes into it. And there was no manner of, of, of talking and the most, uh, uh, you know, the, the pie of the month, you, you, if, you, if you want on any project, is you must say, you know, there's lots of corruption in it so that people start looking at it that this is not a project, it's about money being taken away. And people lost the detail in terms of what is the actual cost, what are the, the, the benefits. Uh, and I'm glad that at least the, the contractor was not dissuaded, the government was not uh, distracted and has delivered ahead of schedule so that people can now get back to the debate with a project now on the table to say did we get it right, did we get it at, at the right cost and, and the numbers will then be justified because at the end of it all this is not just a project for Kenya, it's a project for the region as you rightly said. Um, Uganda has been involved. Uh, I remember having uh, gone to, had to go to Uganda to get the, the discussions with Uganda and then having to process them through cabinet and I think we signed off on that in 2012. So Uganda is on board, Rwanda is on board um, and eventually Zaire should, should get on board the DRCs uh, because of the, 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 the bigger uh, wider implication of connectivity uh, across Africa. And, and uh, you know in the region, uh, sorry Amos, in, in the yeah. region there has been um, this sort of perception that uh, relations um, may be uh, not as rosy as uh, Kenya would want to portray. We, we've seen uh, Uganda take different options, different routes, at least when it came to oil, yes. etc. Uh, uh, Are there any concerns mm. that um, the eventual benefit um, of SGR to the region may be slowed uh, somewhat without uh, full cooperation of, of countries like Uganda which are critical to implementing the, the second uh, phase if you like. No, I, I know Uganda is, is, uh, is, is actually still on board. You know the politics of the day will be do we go Tanzania, do we go Uganda, do we go another route. Mm -hmm. But remember this, this uh, train is not uh, ferrying uh, goods and services uh, that are carried by owned by the government is by the private business community and the business community will go for the least cost of ferrying their goods if they find that it's easier to move their goods from Mombasa through the SGR or from Tanzania through whatever will come up in Tanzania that is a business decision that will have to be made but the beauty is that if you look at the cargo coming into Mombasa uh, about 100% um, of that cargo will come into Nairobi, or almost, apart from just a little bit that's been used in Mombasa, and about 25% of that may proceed into Uganda, Rwanda, Sudan, uh, and all that. And it's that cargo that we are now looking at, how do we then ensure those business, that business community in the neighboring countries get the, business, the, the, the benefit of, of uh, the efficiency in the transportation system. RVR is still there to transport part of that. The trucks that will be moving from uh, the Mombasa to Nairobi route will be there to, to service that route. And eventually the sense will prevail, the uh, political sense will prevail um, within the leadership of um, the neighboring ca countries and they will follow where the business community want to go. So right. I wouldn't worry about the politics for now. Uh, business decisions will be made by the business community and they will drive the politics in their countries to see where the support will come. And, and I think it's important to add on that mm -hmm. even today, mm -hmm. um, offtake from the port of Mombasa, 70% mm. does not go beyond Nairobi. Mm -hmm. but, and so I think it's important first and foremost to remember that this particular project is important for Kenya. Kenya you know, Kenya, uh, I mean even if we had no other country uh, that had any interest in what we're doing, it would be important enough for the country. Mm -hmm. However, as uh, Amos says, uh, uh, whatever the political positions of the day, business sense will prevail and will uh, take the lead. I mean, I expect manufacturers in Kampala uh, and even as far as Kigali to take the, the, the most optimal uh, supply chain route. And remember that this, as I said, and I keep saying this, this is in a larger context, the efficiency of the port of Mombasa, mm -hmm. and there are several projects yes. uh, under Vision yeah. 2030 mm -hmm. under the minister, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of adding the bats and making the port of Mombasa more efficient. The efficiency of the port of Mombasa vis-a-vis -vis neighboring ports is a big part. Um, of what the, the sensibilities of businessmen who will be making decisions as to where what supply chain route uh, they want to use. Eventually also as these countries develop, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Rwanda into middle income countries all, we will need a lot of railways crisscrossing these countries, exactly. not just one route. And, and so I think having a long term vision and looking at the big picture and sort of
putting aside the politics of the day, which normally is what I intend to do, I think this is a major project. And uh, I just want to say that the debate uh, on costs, uh, on efficiency, on whether you know we should be diesel or electric, is an important debate. Uh, and, and, I mm. and I think it should be welcomed by all, because we must make sure that we interrogate uh, this project. However, um, having said that, the context of what we're doing today must not be lost. Uh, yeah, because I, I, I think it's a valuable project. Yes, sir. You, you, you know, you have an interesting perspective because you've, you've been in government, uh, now in private sector. And so when you hear uh, the opposition saying that uh, should they clinch power, that they would review um, all these contracts, um, part of the larger argument that has been there by analysts is that governments operate in perpetuity, so you can't just really like walk out of one contract to the other. What is your understanding um, of how such projects would commence even under different administrations? You know, um, good question. And that question I think used to be asked a lot, even under, yes. uh, under President Kibaki, because remember that this Vision 2030 started uh, under President Kibaki, and people would ask, what's going to happen, you know, when, 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 when he leaves? And I think the evidence today, which we try to mm -hmm. convince people at the time, is that Vision 2030 still continues. Today we have a major flagship project uh, being officially launched, commissioned, and uh, put online. And I think what happens is that I, I expect, and I think uh, Amos will add to this because he's in that particular field, I expect that political leaders uh, will always do what is most useful for the people. And when they come in, uh, projects that have been in the pipeline for years, because remember that even the SGR, the SGR predated Vision 2030, the, the concept predated Vision 2030. Right, right. And by the time the, the, the post-Kibaki administration, this uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta administration came in, the, a, a lot of the designs had been done, mm -hmm. contractors identified, and they now actually undertook the execution, and I must commend them uh, for having very well executed this. There are other projects today, uh, Lapse Project for instance, the Port of Mombasa, uh, Konza City, uh, the airport projects, which have been conceptualized in different times under different regimes in this country and today several regimes later are still in the pipeline now should you know you can quibble about how quickly or how you know how efficiently they're being implemented but the fact that these projects continue apace because it is all the people of the country of kenya need and demand i think should give confidence to all of us that whoever uh, takes over today or in future years will ensure that these projects continue apace. Yeah, uh, I, I yeah. must uh, talk to me about the same thing and Muka has uh, brought out an important point that sometimes they can be slowed unnecessarily even if not scrapped altogether. Um, do you have, and then you know the argument that uh, the Kenyatta administration in terms of ideology and thinking doesn't differ sharply from the Kibaki administration so one would expect uh, a, m a certain degree of ease in terms of transition uh, transitional relations. Uh, do you expect that it would be the same um, if the opposition were to uh, come into power? Of course, of course not, uh, Anne, because it's been very clearly stated by the opposition that <coughs> one, one of their tasks is to audit all the projects and stop the ones they don't like, uh, under the guises of, oh, they were corruptly done or uh, sourced and all that. And that is the nature of the typical opposition. But uh, unfortunately, in this country, we have an opposition that does not believe in, you know, living the vision. Because Vision 2030 was about, for the next 30 years, up to the year 2030, governments can change, but let's stick on one national vision. Mm -hmm. And let all projects be aligned towards that national vision. But um, what we've experienced in the last, uh, obviously, in the last four years, and I uh, myself having been on the outside, I've been watching very closely in terms of what's been happening. It's not, you know, working together to achieve the vision. It's more of, you know, catching one another's legs. You know, if you, if who comes up with a project, uh, ODM wants to shoot it down. Um, coming up with whatever it is, yeah, any, 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 um, any policy mission that comes, it's opposite for the sake of opposing rather than saying if it was us, we would have done it this way, you know, providing the alternative. So I think that the most important thing for, for us to, to, to know is that we have major projects that have been initiated. The SGR is just one of them. There's lapset going on. There's the bypasses. There's a commuter, uh, commuter, uh, commuter rail project within the city of Nairobi. There's the decongesting of the cities. 
there is the you know opening up of different uh, uh, regions through the devolution and infrastructure that's required all those projects are at risk of a regime change if that regime change was to amount to a disruption of all those projects and then go back to the drawing board you lose time you lose on cost and, and basically you lose Kenya, uh, the Kenyan taxpayers money so uh, for now I'm encouraged that uh, the, the, the people of Kenya are in support, as it was shown by the opinion polls, of the Jubilee administration. They are excited with the projects going on, and all they need is give them more time to actually deliver on that. Now there comes out the politician. And, and okay, hopefully, and hopefully <laughs> then the opposition will now learn how to support the government of the day All right. so they can demonstrate that if, when they get into power they yes. like similar support. I must hold your thought because we want to take uh, this uh, proceedings live now. Of course the president shortly to uh, address uh, the public. Let's listen to what they're saying. Wafeng 十分高兴，并表示最热烈的祝贺。Your Excellency President Uhuru Kenyatta, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, I'm highly honored to attend a special envoy of Chinese President Xi Jinping, the launching of the Mombasa Nairobi Standard Gauge Railway. President Xi Jinping is very happy to know that this SGR is now ready for operation. He sends the warmest congratulations. Mang 也是肯尼亚最大的基础设施建设工程和二零三零年远景规划的旗舰项目是东部非洲铁路网重要的组成部分这条东非交通大动脉的开通是新时期中肯友谊杰出的硕果也是中肯互利合作的结晶造福非洲人民都具有重要的意义和深远的影响 The SGR is an important early harvest outcome of the Belt and Road Initiative put forward by President Xi Jinping and the 10 cooperation plans of the Falkirk Johannesburg Summit It is also a landmark project in China-Africa cooperation on regional networks of high-speed rail, expressway, and aviation, 
African industrialization and industrial should help you brush up on your Chinese a little bit um, there but of course the Chinese delegation uh, China being the financiers uh, of this project and who will be first to operate um, the railway line um, in Kenya we want to bring in Dr. Paul Kibicho he is an economic analyst is joining us at this hour and Dr. you've been listening to the conversation from um, my guests here in terms of the cost benefit analysis we've had a lot of concern um, coming out regarding the um, increased cost of operating this particular rail of building it um, what is your perspective <coughs> Uh, number one, I want to say hi to my other colleagues. My uh, senior Amos Kimina, congratulations for having been uh, nominated. And of course, my former boss, uh -huh. Mr. Mogo Kibati. My name is Dr. Paul Kibicho, as you said, and uh, I'm, uh, I deal with a lot of matters, finance and economics. So one of the things, as my two other colleagues have said there, is that uh, this is a wonderful thing. Uh, it actually meets the aspirations of many Kenyans. Because number one, when you talk about uh, uh, SGL, you look at so many economic benefits that look eyes there from. Number one, talk about it is cheaper. Number two, it will reduce what we call accidents in Kenya. And you can imagine how much money the government spends in terms of managing the casualties out of those accidents, in terms of maintaining the loads because of those heavy lorries that have been actually uh, using Mobasa load for quite a long time. Talk in terms of uh, what we refer to as even the speed, the, dur the duration of time that will take from Mobasa to Nairobi, to, uh, among other destinations. And uh, I tend to think that... Uh, we must appreciate the fact that uh, when they were starting this project, the cost of raw materials was not, it is not static in nature. Things keep on changing, the cost of production keeps on changing. So there might be some va variance in terms of what we call the total cost of project, but the overall benefits are m much higher than what we call the criticism coming from other uh, quarters. So I agree with them uh, in totality, and I'm, I'm privileged that I have the former Minister for Transport here, Mr. Amos Kemunya, and of course the, the former Director General, Mr. Moko Kebati, who, uh, who actually were involved in, uh, in this particular project. So I would say that the benefits are very, when you do what you call the cost-benefit analysis, the benefits are very high. We wouldn't have had any other better project like uh, this SGL. And in the long run, Kenyans will say that uh, under the tenor of the president, Uhuru Kenyatta and William Ruto. This is one of the best things that they ever did in the Republic of Kenya and beyond. So we have so many benefits arising from this particular project and anyone down taking that, it's a matter of time before they come and embrace. But I can say one thing, and I like what uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Amos Kemunya has said, politics must always have their day. And one of the things that they are good at doing is, is actually perforating and of course punching holes to any project the government undertakes because they have to remain relevant anyway. They know the benefits because most of them have been in government of course they know. But how do they sell their policies to people? They must come up with ways of actually now degrading or other talking bad things about the project. But the project uh, is good. As so a financial we're, person we're talking I agree. About, um, um, the cost and not your own personal feelings regarding yes. the project. But you have said, uh, referred to uh, Mugo Kibati as your former boss. Yes. Could you clarify that? Yes, Mr. Mugo Kibati was my former boss at Pan Africa Life. I worked in Pan Africa Life for 20 years, now currently Sanlam, and that's why he was my boss. Were you associated in, in this project in any way? No, 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 no. I was just one of his staff members. Okay, because there appears to be a very obvious yes. leaning yes. in terms of your analysis yes. of whether the cost, uh, you know, is actually beneficial. Uh, being that, as it may, we're standing at 350 billion so far. There has been um, the concern that um, this could have been built at a much cheaper cost. There's been concern regarding the kind of uh, credits that uh, we're getting, the fact um, that in particular we're getting this um, sort of uh, no strings attached sort of loans um, from China, given the country's very real challenges with corruption. As an economist, um, are you concerned at all in terms of the use of finances and the, and the uh, capacity of the country to repay the sort of debt that it's incurring? Well, I, uh, first of all, I would say that... Uh I, 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 we need to know, there's, there's what we call the procurement uh, policy, uh, processes that goes alongside this kind of a project. So when you talk about maybe the project being very, very expensive, you must be given some information. And uh, one of the things that I can say is that uh, we need to know uh, where were the materials being sourced, what were the cost implications of these materials. And number two, uh, within the process of actually acquiring those particular materials, where there are some drastic changes that could have altered the, the overall cost of the project. But anyway, all in all, we need to appreciate that uh, the viability of a project, people have to take a lot of factors into consideration. Number one, 
what will be the overall benefit that will arise from this particular project and what informed the government to bring this uh, project on board. There must have been very, very serious considerations. So one of the things that I would say is that, number one, we, the project might have consumed 3.7 billion Kenya shillings. Maybe initially it was supposed to cost uh, maybe about 250 billion or 300 billion shillings. But we must appreciate one thing, that, uh, that where we get the materials, there are some other factors that come into play that may alter the actual cost of the, pro the product, uh, the, ma the raw materials being used. So the project, uh, unless somebody has got what we call the figures on the ground, uh, which has been provided to us, by the way, in the public domain, and we are involved about what we call the processes that were undertaken during the procurement, I tend to think that uh, whether there was money, of course there was money borrowed from other development partners, that money in the long run, I think this project will be able to have what we call a break-even point. Because traders, if anybody who actually transports goods from, let's say from Mombasa to Nairobi, or from Kisumu, maybe from Nairobi to Kisumu, or from Kisumu to, to Mombasa, you have to consider a number of things. How much was it costing a single container? I have read, it's actually in the public domain, uh, one container was costing between 80 and 90. So, if that particular cost goes to about 40, 50,000 shillings, now, that particular trader benefits. Number two, the amount of goods that in terms of carriage that moves from one destination to another spurs the economy of a given region. So if there, we need to know that in the final analysis, this particular project will have what you call economic gains that, go, that will go a long way in boosting the overall performance of the economy. Number one. Number two, there's what we call job creation, of course. Number three, we shall have reduced a lot of accidents that we all know this is what we refer to as um, uh, the government has been spending a lot of money in terms of maintaining the loads all those benefits brought together believe you me will bring what we call the overall viability of this particular project and I think the people behind the project they were not wrong so um, let's talk about the, the no strings attached yes, cash um, yes. from China yes. um, and there's been concern in terms of uh, you know the, the strengthening of China's grip on our economy uh, what would you say about that well, e every country borrows money, believe you me. When you talk about, I, I read the other day, and it's once again the public domain, we need to ask ourselves, the amount of money that has been borrowed, has it been used for the right project? Okay, we have issues of corruption coming from all sides. But I think that the grip on China's economy, well, we, look to, we need to look at what we call the bilateral trade uh, benefits arising from what we do with China and of course the fact that maybe given that we, had have, we have had other development partners in the past what, what were they charging us for those particular maybe loans uh, compared to what China is giving us at this point in time so we can't actually ignore the fact that China has given us a lot of money but in the long run this money believe you me will have what you call the benefits to the citizens of the Republic of Kenya it will make the business much easier for us uh, as Kenyans and I do not think that the, the, the amount of money China has given us uh, is going to give them a leeway to control our economy per se. That's a, a, a lot of faith and hope on your part there. Yes, please. Um, thanks for your analysis. Uh, this hour we've been speaking to Mugo Kibati, the founding director general of Vision 2030, Amos Kimunya, former transport minister, and Dr. Paul Kibicho, who's an economic analyst. Uh, we're back with uh, Amos after the break. Stay with us.